Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Temple Baptist Church. Glad you're here in the service with us this morning. Looking forward to a good day in the Lord's house. Let's go ahead and get started by taking your hymn books, turning to song number 78. Song number 78, the words will be up on the screen. We're going to be singing about heaven this morning. Always a good thing to sing about. When we all get to heaven, we'll sing the first, second, last verse of this song. Let's lift up our voices. Song number 78. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. Great singing on that first song. Turn over to song number 249. Song 249 in your hymn book. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. We're going to sing all three verses of this song. Let's lift up our voices and worship him this morning. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows are spelling with joy I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Just fight fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made When as a sinner I came Took of the offer of grace and it proper He saved me, oh praise his dear name Heaven came down and glory filled my soul When at the cross the Savior made me whole My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. On the last, now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed. Riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Amen. Get 
up there on that high note. That'll wake you up in the morning. Good to have everybody in the service. So glad that you're here with us. We want to welcome all of our visitors. If you're with us for the very first time, you should have received a welcome packet as you came in the door. It's got some information about the church, some of our ministries that we have. Uh, also, there's a connection card. We'd ask that you fill that out. And then on your way out, there's uh, a couple black offering boxes on the back wall. Just slip those in there. We can have a record of your visit. Uh, and get in touch with you later through a text or an email and just say thank you for spending your Sunday. I'm looking around, looks like mostly home folk with us this morning, but looking forward to a good day uh, in God's house this morning. We're going to continue right on with our singing this morning, some of our newer songs that we've been learning. I like this next one, He Will Hold Me Fast. It shows where our strength is. It's not in ourselves. We don't have hope in and of what we can do in our flesh. Our strength is in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one who holds yesterday, today, forever. He holds the future, and he can hold our life no matter what trials may come our way. So let's lift up our voices and sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. he saves are his delight Christ will hold me fast precious in his holy sight he will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last bought by him at such a cost he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. For my he bled and died Christ will hold me fast justice has been satisfied he will hold me fast raised with him to endless life he will hold me fast till our faith is turned to side when he comes at last, he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast. So he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Amen. Great singing this morning. We're going to do one more song, one of our newer ones we've been learning. We've done this a few times, but we're going to be singing about the goodness of God. I love this song as well. And love being able just to sing about my Lord. And so let's lift up our voices and sing on this last song, The Goodness of God. I love you, Lord. 
Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, and in darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running out. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Great singing this morning. You may be seated. Again, want to welcome everyone that's with us. Want to remind everyone about our announcements. We have our tithes and our offering announcement. Uh, instead of passing the plate, we do uh, it on your own now. We have offering boxes in the back that you can give uh, on your way in or on your way out. Just slip in an envelope. The deacons empty that after each service. Uh, you can uh, mail in your check if you're not able to be with us in person. Uh, if you know the church address, you can always send it in there, and we receive that. Also on our website. Uh, if you like to do things more electronically, like myself, uh, there's our website, and it's got a giving tab. Uh, you can even set up a recurring giving amount. If it's something that sometimes slips your memory, uh, you can set that up very easily. And so uh, several ways for you to get involved. We have several announcements that we want to make. Uh, hopefully I get all these right. We have our May focus night is going to be on May the 2nd. And so it's just a quick three-week turnaround from our last focus night. Uh, but it's the first Sunday of May, and I've really been enjoying our focus nights. We've had two of them so far, and uh, being able to see several people engaging and getting involved with this, uh, one, my group, uh, we've had a great time in, in just discussing the people that we're interacting with, uh, and several of them have made good progress with their person, 
Uh, and it was encouraging to know that some of them were doing this before we ever did the focus night. And that's also encouraging, knowing that, hey, you had uh, people in your group that were already working on someone and uh, trying to make those connections and those inroads. But just keep praying for us and praying for those focus nights to go well. And uh, if you're in the focus nights, let's keep uh, remain faithful in praying for each other and lifting each other up in prayer. And I know that God will bless uh, those uh, efforts. We have our cleanup day, which is April 24th. That is supposed to be this Saturday. Um, and that's going to be uh, 10, a meeting here at the church at 10. Now, if for some reason we get rain, which it may call for, um, then we're going to have an alternate day, which is May 1st. All right. And so keep that in mind. We are planning on the 24th. If there's no rain, if it's sun shining, we'll be here at 10 o'clock uh, cleaning up the church and finishing up the fence. Uh, and if it is rain, you look outside and it's wet and it's raining. Uh, the alternate day will be May 1st. Um, and so hopefully uh, things work out and we don't have to do it on a different day. We can just go ahead and get it done uh, right away. But keep that in mind uh, either this Saturday, but if it rains, May 1st uh, at 10 o'clock here at the church. Um, what other announcements do I have? Just keep, yeah, there we go. Business meeting uh, is tonight after the evening service. And so uh, going over uh, where we're at in the budget right now uh, and any. Uh, anything that you would want to know about that. So very quick meeting right after the service uh, this evening. And so members, make sure that you're here uh, in your place. Uh, do I have any other ones? Power Up Sunday, April 25th. That is next Sunday. We're going to have Pastor Brian Jackson with us. I always enjoy having Brother Brian Jackson, someone we've known for a very long time. Uh, and he usually comes in and does our Valentine's banquet. But because of COVID and stuff like that, we didn't really do anything. So we are still going to have him in, and he's going to be here all Sunday. So Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, he's going to be preaching for us. And this is uh, kind of a charge up, uh, rev us up, get us excited about our Friend Faith Fellowship uh, theme that we have going with us. Our focus nights revolve around it. We're going to have our fellowship groups that we're going to be starting midway through the year. Those are going to revolve around it. We're trying to get all, really everything that's within the church is going to revolve around this idea of friend, faith, fellowship, and everyone getting involved, everybody doing their part. And so this is going to be one of those charge-up Sundays. He's a fantastic preacher and a great man. Looking forward to having him here. That is next Sunday, so be in your place. That Sunday school uh, will be combined teens on up to the adult classes. We'll all be here uh, in, the, in the main service uh, for that Sunday school. Also, Mother's Day brunch. This is going to be May 8th at 11 a.m., at 2021 in case you were wondering we're not going back a year it is going to be in 2021 not last year or the year next year i just thought that was interesting that we put that year there um but that's going to be at 11 a.m amber's going to kill me for doing that later i just found that funny uh but yeah may 8th at 11 a.m it's going to be here at the church and so mothers uh ladies you be uh ready for that i'm sure we'll get more uh details to come uh, the closer that we get to that date, but uh, look forward to having a good day uh, there. And also, yes. Yes, sorry. In the bulletin, if you use that to read your announcements, it says May 9th. That's wrong. It was right on the board, May 8th. Um, and so keep that in mind. And as, like I said, as we get close to it, we'll give a few more details uh, about that. And then teen retreat. This is going to be July 29th through August 1st. And we're just announcing this so far in advance so that everyone can be fully ready and prepared. Uh, the deposit to get in uh, that they need to have is 100 bucks. It needs to be in by the end of May. That covers food and the lodging for, for us. Uh, we've already arranged them. We've already reserved them. So now we just need uh, the money to go. And then any other money they want to bring, that's on them. They can bring it with them. So parents, if you're just giving your child some money for it, uh, the $100 needs to come to the church. Other than that, they can keep it for themselves. Uh, and they can bring as much as they want. I told um, uh, some of them that are working, I said, if you want to bring more than $100 spending, you can do that. Uh, if you want to bring less, you can do that as well. Uh, also, uh, if you have some work, I know I've talked with several. Um, if you got some odd jobs that the teens can do. Um, most of them need to be done on a Saturday. I should, I should specify this. Just our teens, they're busy throughout the weeks. They got sports. They got school. They got a lot of things that they're involved in. And so weekends are usually the best for them to be able to get out and actually do some work. Um, they have some that can do it on weekdays. But just keep that in mind if you have them. Uh, we did some work at Brother Mike's yesterday. 
had Colin and Jerry uh, Hummel with us, and they worked excellent. Uh, they were very hard workers yesterday, got a lot accomplished there, and so I want to thank Mike for allowing them to have that opportunity, and thankful for some of the teams for doing some work for us. And we got some other jobs planned up, uh, planned out that are coming along, uh, but if you have some uh, other jobs for us, let myself or Amber know, um, and we're just going to let these teens work and earn some money. Uh, I believe uh, that is all the announcements that we have. I know that's uh, quite a lot that we go through, but uh, get those out of the way and uh, get ready for the message. We're going to do uh, one special, uh, What a Savior. Uh, it's an old hymn that I enjoy singing. I know a lot of people like this song, uh, but let's just, uh, if you want to follow along in your hymn book, it's on page 532, uh, but if not, you can just listen to the words. Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior to save a poor lost soul like me oh what a savior oh hallelujah his heart was broken on calvary his hands were nail Father with all his riches with calmness sweet and serene came down from heaven and gave his life blood to make the vilest sinner clean. Oh, what a Savior! Oh, hallelujah! His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nail-scarred. His side was riven. He gave his life blood for even me death's chilly waters I'll soon be crossing but his hand will lead me safe for then I'll join the chorus Savior, oh hallelujah, his heart was broken on Calvary, his hands were nail-scarred, his side was riven, he gave his life blood for even me. blood for even me. After a song like that, I think I'd just like to go to the Lord in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you for the most precious gift ever given, the Lord Jesus Christ.
Father, I, I think so many things competed for our attention, even during that song of singing to the glory and grace of Jesus Christ. In all that you did and all that Jesus accomplished, Lord, maybe we were more mindful of the activities of the week or the discouragement of the day. Maybe, Lord, we missed out on an opportunity to glorify you and praise you and worship you this morning, but can I say thank you for your goodness and your grace and your love. Lord, we would not know love were it not for you. Lord, were it not for your sacrifice, were it not for you loving us where we're at. God, thank you for making a way for our souls to be saved, our sins to be forgiven, and for us to be part of your family through the precious gift of Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, because you live, we can live. And we give you all the praise, the honor, and glory because you so richly and justly deserve it. And it's in your name and your name alone that we pray and ask these things and praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen Amen and amen. What a great song of praise and worship about Jesus Christ. How can you not be lit up about that, to think that the God of heaven traded places with us, that, that we wouldn't have to suffer like he suffered, that we could just simply be included in the family of God and for God the Father to call us dear sweet children. What a, what a great Savior that we have. Amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. I have it on my slide. So we're... We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and and listen, y'all, the more I get into this, the more it's absolutely turning me on my head and causing me to rethink what God's trying to communicate to us. I mean, I can't tell you how many dozens and dozens and dozens of times that I have read this passage of Scripture, and I have equated it to a list of things that I needed to endeavor to do. And I don't know if you were guilty of the same thing, but I sure have been. And I have approached my Christianity thinking, man, this fruit of the Spirit I need to do, I need to really include this more in my life. And if I'm a good Christian, I'll, I'll have these things uh, evident, and I need to try to be more loving, and, and I need to try to be more long-suffering, and I need to try to be better and good, and and, you know, all these things that, that the fruit of the Spirit is. And, and I just need to do these things. And the more I study it, the deeper I see God just trying to scream at the top of his lungs through the written word of God, you've got it all wrong. What I mean to do in and through you is manifest myself so that people are looking at me and not you. And so we've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter number 5, and last week we did a little comparison between, actually it's been two weeks, uh, well not consecutive, we had a little break for, uh, what was that holiday? Oh yes, Resurrection uh, Day, Uh, and uh, we we did a contrasting between the flesh and the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, biggest place in scripture where it actually shows the warfare that's going on between our body, our nature, our flesh, how we are as natural human beings, and the war that goes on between the Spirit of God and those that are Christians, those that are born again, those that possess the Spirit of God. There's a battle that happens between your natural body and your born again spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God that, that wars and struggles in our daily life. And, and we did a comparison in that. And so what I'd like to do is read through uh, uh, Galatians chapter number 5. We'll begin uh, at verse 15. It's up on the, uh, on the screen there, slide 44, Brother Bob. We'll not read the whole chapter for time's sake. Uh, 
uh, but uh, just track with me at verse 15, Galatians chapter number 5. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And you remember last week when we did the comparison? Uh, just it amazes me how God's Word comes together. Uh, every first word in Paul's writings, uh, and when he gets to doing a list, that is the primary function or purpose of the list. In other words, that first word will be the, the priority of that list, and the rest of the list is going to support that first word. So the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, and he says adultery. And now you may think, well, that's kind of odd to hang everything on adultery, but we're talking about relationships, are we not? If you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, you are the bride of Christ. You are, are going to be Jesus Christ's wife. Now, now that's kind of, it is kind of, whoop, you know, kind of cool. But, you know, in, in our flesh, we, us dudes kind of think, whoa, back the train up. You know, I don't know about all that stuff. I know what I am, right? I'm not confused with the rest of these people, don't know which bathroom to go in. That's not this dude. I know it's the one, right? I, 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 it's, it's. Three letters. Do you know what they are? Men, right? M-E-N. And I understand that distinction because God took the time to point that out in his word. Please somebody say amen. amen. Good. I'm glad I'm not dealing with a bunch of liberal millennials here this morning. But we understand who's who and what's what. Amen? Amen. Okay, so, right? So adultery has to do with the breaking of a relationship. Well, all the things that come past adultery have to do with that one act of adultery which is selfish, which destroys a relationship. Every other thing, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like, all of those are, are based on a selfish motivation of life. I do those things because I'm only concerned with me. And every relationship that's ever ended up in ashes is the adulterating of it, thinking of self over the unity of relationship. Every husband and wife that I've counseled in a struggling marriage, you know what the problem is? Too much thinking of self, not enough concentration on the relationship as one. God said, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. But we've allowed society to talk us into the battle of the sexes. We've allowed society to talk us into 50-50. You do your part, I'll do my part. No, that's not the scripture. Do you understand Jesus Christ did everything for you and me? He's the driver of that vehicle. He's the driver of righteousness, the driver of love, the driver of unity. He's one Lord, one God, one body, one spirit, and it's one salvation, and he's placed us into that. And we are one with Christ. To do anything against that relationship is an adulterous act. Now, are you tracking with me? Because I'm going somewhere with this. That's all by way of review. So, let's go on to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now let me catch up to my uh, 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 notes here. Uh, and they that are Christ have crucified the, the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And so uh, chapter 5 is giving a contrast between the flesh and the Spirit and we're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit, verse number 22, from the aspect that it also has to do with relationship. And we're going to see the priority of the fruit of the Spirit as it starts with its first list, 
which is love, all right? So that's just kind of a, of a review. We're going to pick up uh, here, uh, Brother Bob, at uh, uh, slide number 60, okay? So slide number 60, uh, we were looking at the fruit of the Spirit and uh, how it's manifest in us. Uh, we looked last week that we can't produce it in and of ourselves, and just think of it this way. If you've ever found, hey, come on, look at me. It's, uh, it's 10.30 in the morning. You slept at, at night. If you can't stay awake for 30 minutes in a church service, go to bed earlier. We're preaching the word of God, and it has to do with your eternal soul, so I think you ought to pay attention a little bit. That's just what I'm thinking. Everybody okay? That's my job, okay? The word of God is quick and it's powerful, but if we're sleeping, it's lame. Now, you still like me? Okay, good. All right, here we go. But sit on attack. I don't care. Do what you got to stand, I, I, right? I, I might go into a shouting fit if somebody stood, right? Oh, they're getting a the spirit, all right? So, okay, now, now listen, this is a, it's, it's so important because what, what I'm sharing with you with the Word of God is going to transform your life. You won't look at your relationship with Christ the same again. It, it will transform you from doing church to being the church, and that's why I'm kind of being a little forceful this morning, okay? So don't think I don't love you. I do love you, but man, I'm. have you ever had your parent correct you? They did that not because they were being jerks, but because they love you. They wanted you to be good and better. And, and so God wants us to abound and thrive in this. So, so, so just stay with me. So this, this fruit of the Spirit can't be manufactured by you and I. In other words, we can't wake up and say, you know what, I, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, and, and I've just got to determine to love more. I've got to determine to have more peace in my life. And, and so we set out in our Christian walk, trying to check these things off a list, okay? And, and what that's going to produce is, is frustration. It's going to produce love, but no joy and no peace. Man, I'm really endeavoring to love this person, but man, it's just, it's killing me. They're wearing me out. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. That's a work of the flesh. And so we need to really pay attention to this dynamic of relationship and the fact that if our flesh is producing the fruit of the Spirit, it's an adulterous relationship because the flesh can't please God, the flesh can't produce the work of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is manifest. It comes out in and through us, and we're going to look at that. So we're going to look at, uh, we looked at last week that you're a part of the Lord. Uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, if you abide in me and I in you, the same bring forth much fruit. And so that's a relationship, right? Lost people can't produce the fruit of the Spirit, and neither can a saved producing person produce the fruit of the Spirit, but because a saved person has the Holy Ghost of God in them, the Holy Spirit of God can manifest himself in our life. So we're part of the Lord. Uh, we are a testimony that points to God. So if we're allowing the fruit of the Spirit to manifest itself through us, that's always pointing to Christ and not to us as individuals. It's a fragrance that people cannot deny. We, we did the correlation between the Old Testament and the, the tabernacle and the temple. Do you all remember that? With the anointing oil, which is a type of the Holy Spirit, and the perfume that anointed the uh, tent and the temple is the only fragrance, you, the only time you could smell that fragrance was in the house of God. And so all pointing to this relationship of Christ and that you and I can't produce it, but it can manifest itself through us and it should point to the Lord. And then this week where we're going to start is the purpose of these ingredients. The purpose of the nine, most people would say fruits of the Spirit, but it's nine fruit of the Spirit. In other words, uh, tell me what the parts of an apple are. You got the core, you got the stem, you got the seeds, you got the pithy white part, right? Well, you got the, you got the, the what do you call that? The, the casein or peel, peel, it's appealing. Uh, you got the juice. So, so there's many aspects to that apple, but, but we don't say the apples of the fruit, right? We say, no, it's, it's an apple. 
and all those aspects are to it. Well, when we're thinking of the fruit of the Spirit, we're thinking of one fruit, it's the Spirit, but it's going to be manifested in a few different ways for you and I. And it's, it's, it's broken up into three sections, and so we're going to look at that. Uh, so uh, let's continue this morning uh, on the first section. So there's nine, there's nine fruit, if you will, if I can just put it that way, or, or ingredients uh, to the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, they're divided into three sections, and so that works out mathematically, three, three, three is how much? Nine, well, there's nine ingredients to the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to look at the first section uh, this week, but let me just kind of mention these in passing so that our mind is set on the right path. So the first one is love, joy, peace. That's the first set of three. We, we found out that love is the principal ingredient and that all the others are going to support that, but uh, the, the, the three of love, joy, and peace have a specific purpose for you and I, and that's the inward. That's the inward look, the manifestation of a right relationship uh, with God. In other words, if love, joy, and peace are manifesting themselves in your life, that's evident that you have a good, healthy, right relationship with the Lord, if those things are prevalent. If those things are not prevalent, then we're adulterating that relationship by including other things in it that are not necessary and are damaging to the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Much like a human relationship, when, when uh, a man introduced uh, a foreign substance into relationship by way of another woman or by way of pornography or by way of another thing that battles for the attention of that relationship, that does damage to that relationship. Well, the same for a Christian. If, if I don't have love, joy, and peace, which is manifesting itself through me, there's something that's not right in my walk with the Lord. Y'all have been there when, when a relationship is strained. I can walk into my house and I know if things are okay or not okay between me and Tracy. I can sometimes physically because she throws things at me. I'm a battered man. She hits me with rolling pins. I, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. With the broom, you ought to see her with a She's a ninja with a broom. No, no, she's not. Um, I, ha I had a really good funny that I was getting ready to say, but I would have to stay at one of y'all's house for a little time, so I'm going to back that train up. That's flesh, not spirit. Okay, so uh, you can see how they battle one against the other, right? And so uh, there's a right relationship, and you can feel it. Well, if love, joy, and peace aren't flowing from your life, don't think that you're right with God. In other words, how many Christians do you know spend their life ticked at the preacher, ticked off at another member, they're, they're grumbling, they're, they're, they're sowing discord. Oh, oh, they, they don't do it that way, mind you. They just get in little groups and they, they talk so that they can pray about stuff. Because we're concerned. Hmm. Would joy and peace be attached to that kind of love? No, it wouldn't. So what's happening is the flesh is manufacturing this idea of I'm a lovely, loving Christian. So there's some strain in that. Relate. That's the inward look. How many of you remember that there's a children's song? Take a good look at the old book, take a good look from God's word. You remember it? Get the new look from the old book, get the new look from God's word, the inward look, the outward look, the upward look from the old, old book. Did I say that right? Barb, Barb saying yes, my wife saying yes, probably that's correct. And so uh, because the word of God filters through us and it has a multidimensional uh, effect in our life, an inward effect, which is what is coming out, 
an outward effect, which is what people are experiencing, and then an upward, which is what God sees. And so let's look at these. The inward look is love, joy, peace. Well, there's a outward look. That's long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. That's what others see of the Holy Spirit of God manifesting him, his fruit through us. And so long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, there's really a great breakdown to that. I kind of can't wait to get there, but I will. Uh, that's the outward manifestation to others of a right relationship to God. So that love, joy, and peace says within us, I'm right with the Lord. It's that peace of mind. It's that peace of heart. I, I feel centered. I, I, I feel true and right and honest with my walk before the Lord. And, and that's internal. But, but those three, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, that is others bearing witness of the Holy Spirit of God working and manifesting himself through us. Are you following me? So that's how they see that we have a right relationship with God. And then the upward look, which is next, uh, that's faith, meekness, and temperance. That's the manifestation of what God sees in our walk uh, with him. So in other words, God is seeing a right walk with us and him from the vantage point of he's observing faith, meekness, and temperance in us because that's done unto the Lord, not unto somebody else. Let me break it down a little bit for you. In the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, one of the greatest places in Scripture that you can actually go to define the husband-wife relationship. And the husband-wife relationship, in fact, I've had some husbands and, well, fiancés, before they got married, right? Uh, they would say, mm, I don't want you to read that because I don't like that part. Because, gals, you don't like it when the Bible says, submit. Right? And I'll submit, I'll submit. I'll submit him in second round, 30 seconds into it. I'll tap him out uh, or break his arm. Uh, you know what I mean? So, it, we, gals, you don't like that because in the modern day, that's, that seems to be oppressive. But understanding it from a godly perspective, it says that all of us submit ourselves as unto the Lord. So wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And so there's a submission on both parts. And, and God sees that submission, that, that faith, that meekness, that temperance as an act of submission to him that we're doing that um, because oftentimes we live our life in this dynamic. I will love somebody, I will be meek with somebody, I will be temperate with somebody, I will be long-suffering with somebody, I'll be gentle, I'll be good. I, I, I will do that if, if they deserve it or they act right. So now we're doing that unto them not unto the Lord. Can I ask you a question here this morning? I, I, man, I haven't even started preaching yet. Uh, can I ask you a question this morning? Every one of you that are here that are born-again Christians, if you're a born-again Christian, raise your hand. You've trusted Christ as your Savior. Okay, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus Christ love you because of what you were? Because you deserved it? Because you were this good church going? You're from a Christian family? You had all of your junk together? I mean, you're, you're just a good person. No, the well, uh, Bible tells me in Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, but God commendeth or demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ didn't wait for us to be ripe and ready. To, I, I hear people all the time say, well, I, just, well, I need to get my life under control before I get saved. Not going to happen. You got a God that loved you. You got a God that submitted, showed you a submissive relationship by humbling himself, coming down to this earth and taking on the form of a man, and not just a man, but a servant, and humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We have an example from our God and Savior that submitted himself to the will of the Father to buy a sinful world. And you and I get the glory and righteousness of Jesus Christ because Christ submitted him. Not my will, but thine be done. So, we, we, right, that, that faith, meekness, and temperance, 
we ought to be living our life as it pleases the Lord. Is he pleased with us? Because that's all we need to care about. Does God see our submission to him by our walk of faith? Our dependence upon him, our belief in him. Does God see us with a meek spirit because God is worthy of our submission, not the people around us? We submit because he said to be meek and that a meek spirit he would not despise. And so these three areas, the inward look of the fruit of the Spirit, the outward look of the fruit of the Spirit, and the upward look of the fruit of the Spirit, these are three things that God is revealing to us. There, it's not just a list of nine. Are you following me? Each one of these has purpose and meaning that God said, really, if you're truly a born-again believer, these things are going to be evident in your life by me manifesting myself in them. So let's get going on love. I better get my phone out because I'm so enjoying this study, y'all. I, 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 I just don't know if I'm transferring it well enough, but this, this is an amazing passage of scripture that has profound impact on your life. And so uh, uh, let, let's go ahead and, and get down to business here. James chapter 3, verse number 12, uh, the Bible says this, Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? either a vine figs, uh, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh water. And so where I wanted to go with that with you all is that you got to be in the body to produce the body. you got to be the Lord Jesus Christ's possession before Christ can manifest himself through you. Do you understand you need to have the Spirit before you can manifest the Spirit. A lost person cannot manifest the Holy Spirit of God. So you're not going to get salt water and fresh water from the same place. Okay? So keeping that in mind, do I possess the Holy Spirit of God because I am saved, born again? Am I a child of God? And if I am, I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. And there should be some evidence of that. First ingredient, if you will, of the fruit of the Spirit is love. It is the priority that contains all of the fruit. Slide 67, Bob, is showing uh, uh, the, 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 the starting slide that I have, but it's the bottles of the fruit. So you see these nine flavors here, but one fruit, and we use the apple illustration. Love is the primary ingredient by which all the others are going to support and reflect that one thing. And the reason that that's the priority is the same reason that we did the contrast with the flesh and the spirit. Adultery, right, affects the flesh. Our relationship with Christ is not fleshly. Our relationship with Christ is spiritual. So as those two were connected, so the fruit of the spirit is love should be the key thing for you and I. Why would love be the defining factor of God in you. Have you ever thought about that before? Now, now, maybe you're thinking this morning that, oh, I got to love more. I got to love better. I got to be a lovely person. That's not what we're talking about because you've boiled down that ingredient to an action. Right? Are you, would you consider yourself a lovely person? A loving person? A lovable person? Everybody's being real quiet there. Why? Because we think of this ingredient as an action. Can I just prove differently from Scripture this morning so that we have a right perspective of what God's trying to teach us through this passage of Scripture? Uh, these nine flavors are one fruit uh, because the Bible tells us that love isn't primarily an action. If we're going to define it in biblical context, love is a person. Who's that person? God, that's right. So go to uh, 1 John 4, and we're going to be in this passage of Scripture, but kind of pacing through this uh, message, if I can keep on track. We're already at 
24 minutes after 11, and uh, I need God to reverse the clock back so it'll be good. Um, so 1 John 4, 8 says this, He that loveth not knoweth not God for what? God is love. So it's not an action it is a person that manifests itself through an individual. And we love because we are God's. You want to know what the perfect definition of love is? I would challenge you sometime to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. The Bible's word for godly love is called charity. Uh, we've changed the name of charity to a kind act. Well, uh, that's not the definition of charity in a biblical sense. Charity is godly love being manifest. And so you want to do a deep dive into how God describes this, this godly person of love? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 will line it out for you, the person of God. And so love is a person, not necessarily an action. We get the cart before the horse because we try to do acts of love without letting the person of love manifest himself through us. And how many of us have messed up this thing of love? I mean, right? I, lost people have gotten wealthy about writing songs about love. Haven't they? I'm all out of love. You can't buy me love. You know, I mean, just on and on and on. and I mean, just crazy love. Right? Lost love. Why? Because they're not thinking about the person of love. They're thinking about the action of it. And man, can I just tell you this morning that I can mess that one up pretty good. I mean, guys, look at me. How many of you have found yourself in the doghouse because you didn't love your wife, right? Or your girlfriend. You forgot something, forgot a date, or you didn't pay attention to something new that they got. Or, or you didn't appreciate enough. Don't raise your hand, brother. We're in the doghouse together. I, I know it, man. Look, I'm mayor of that town. <laughs> man, I'm seeing guys, oh, right? I, right? We, we mess that up or, or, or we say something unkind. Now, I know those of you that just got married, right? You're, you're still in that honeymoon <laughs> stage and everything's beautiful and lovely and perfect. It's coming. <laughs> well, we're celebrating 35 years in June, and I'm telling you, it's coming. <laughs> Free counseling when it does, bro. <laughs> Brian, you too. I know, buddy. I know. I know. Just throw your hands in the air like you don't care, right? Why? Because we're not allowing, now, now, now this is significant, if you get this this morning, you're on your way to changing the dynamic of your walk with the Lord forever. Because I would venture to say, unless I'm wrong, unless I'm just some wicked sinner and a lousy preacher that has this wrong, it, 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 if I'm not wrong, it's the thing that we're getting wrong continually. We're not, we're not doing it right because it's not God doing it through us. It's us trying to manufacture this love and do the best we can. But the problem is we're adulterating that. So love is not primarily an action. It's primarily a person. And so God is love. Uh, let's, let's go on. Uh, so love is a person, but uh, love is internal. And love manifests itself outwardly. So verse 9 of 1 John 4, 8 through 12, in this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And, uh, and Romans 5, 5, and hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And so we see that this internal person of God, this, this God who is love is going to manifest itself because that's what godly love does. 
For, finish it for me. For God, see, she's saying amen. That was a hallelujah in two-year-old or one-year-old, right? Sick em, preacher, that's what she was saying. Finish this for me. For God so loved the world that he gave. He showed us. But God commendeth, that word commendeth means demonstrated, his love towards us, right? So godly love, the person of God shows love toward others. It manifests itself. Even when the other person doesn't deserve it. Love, hey, hey, listen, y'all, love's not circumstantial. Have you ever heard the jokers say this? Well, we've just fallen out of love. Well, I got news for you. You didn't fall in love. Right? That's a misnomer that the world put in. Like, oops, it was an accident, I tripped. Fell headlong right into love with this person. No, it was a conscious effort on your part. You made a decision to love. Love's manifested. Love is internal and then shows itself outwardly. It, it's a, you've heard it. They, they, they say some of the right things, but they don't know it. Uh, it's a matter of the heart. I can't help it. People say, oh, that person's wrong for you. And, and, and they say, I can't help it. They're my soulmate. I just, I can't help it. I love them, right? What teenager girl hasn't told that to her parents? Can't help it, Dad. I, I love him. But he's a loser. I can't help it. The heart wants what the heart wants, right? And by the way, guys, Pretty much no dad's going to love you because you're stealing their baby. So you, you got three strikes against you just starting out, right? The only way to get over it is bribe them with large sums of money. See, back in the old days, they would give them cows and sheep and stuff, right? Uh, so, I, but there's, there's, a, there, there's a manifestation of love that starts from the inside, works its way out, and it's regardless, if it's godly love, it's regardless of whether a person is deserving of that. Are you tracking with me? So the fruit of the Spirit is love that's preeminent. It's a person. It's internal and manifested outwardly. Well, how, how does that look in Scripture? Where does Scripture define this internal love that manifests itself outwardly? Uh, I'm glad you asked. Romans 13, verse number 10. This is the love for others. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And so, uh, godly love manifests itself to the neighbor and it doesn't work ill toward them. There's never a time when we're trying to manipulate or get one up on our neighbor or, or get revenge for our neighbor. You follow me? It's just we love because God's in us. And when we're struggling with that, that should be red sirens like Walmart. Do you remember, how many of you remember Kmart? I know that's really back in the day. The Blue Light Special, you've been there. I, I love Blue Light Specials, right? Because those were good deals, and you could recognize that through the store, right? Because, well, guess what? If there's no Blue Light Special on your love button, you're working it in the flesh. If you're disappointed in love, there's something not right in your relationship with God because it's not manifesting itself. And so love for others, a godly, holy ghost love, loves in spite. Love working no ill toward his neighbor. Not only is it a love for others, but it's a love for Christians. I, seriously, I could, do, I, could do a, I could do a series just on this aspect right here. Christians are the only one that bite and devour and kill their, their wounded, their weak. We stamp them to nothingness because of our self-righteousness. Because we actually think that God loves us better than a struggling, weak, sinful Christian. Guess what? In God's eyes, we're all struggling, weak, sinful Christians, and yet he loves us in spite of ourselves. So why don't we just take ourselves off the cross 
and nail our pride to it and our flesh to it and, and let the love of God manifest itself in our life. Love for other Christians. Next slide, Bob. John 13, 35. By this is Jesus Christ talking to his key disciples that are going to disciple and spread the gospel to the whole world. He says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. You want to know why that's so important? Because you can't be a good Christian and manifest the fruit of the Spirit, love, if you're at odds with another Christian. You're, 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 you're kidding yourself. Say you love God, say you're a good, solid Christian, and yet you've got a problem with another believer. Jesus Christ said, look, the only way this world's going to know that you're genuine and you're sincere and you're right is if you have love one toward another. And can I submit to you that you're impossible to love? And so am I. It's, it's only the love of God that allows you to love me and me to love you because don't we all fall short? Don't we all have problems? Don't we all manifest that flesh and isn't it ugly on everybody? Some people say, ooh, you know, my flesh looks so good. You're striking a pose, you're doing your flesh yoga, and you know, your flesh looks real good to you, but it makes God sick. Revelation chapter 3, the Laodicean church, I'll spew you out of my mouth because you're so enamorated with yourself and your flesh. It makes me sick, but the only way you and I can do this is if the person of God is manifesting himself in our life and we love like God loves us. You see, this is a cool thing. Now listen to me. If you are saved, do you know Romans chapter 8 says that there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God? Not one thing, not one thing Satan can do, not one thing this world can do, not one bonehead thing that you and I can do. Nothing separates us from the love of God. Why? Because God is the person of love and he chose. He chose to love us in our sin. He cho do you understand that he made that decision before the foundations of the world were ever put in? God knowing the beginning from the end, God chose sinful, wicked people, and that he would love them to bring them back to himself. That's the kind of love. And, and y'all, I can't do it. I don't have that kind of power. But when I'm submitted to the person of Christ, that one ingredient of love becomes an overwhelming influence in my life that allows me to love as the person of God. It's a powerful thing. I, and the more I study this, the more inadequate I see myself and I become. But I don't want that to be a discouragement to me. I want that to be a motivation to me to allow more of God to flow through me. And how do I do that? If you want to do an act, a work, a task, do this one. Kill your flesh. Right? Beat it into submission. If you want to do a good work, just pulverize every fleshly desire that you have, and then the person of God will have the liberty to manifest itself because there won't be anything in the way. So, love for other Christians. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if, big word, you have love one toward another. So, not only to uh, love others, uh, but love Christians, um, God's also uh, uh, telling us that uh, we'll have a love for him. Let's continue on in the love chapter of 1 John chapter 4, and let's look at verses 11 and 12. Beloved, if God so loved us, so it's in proportion, it's measurable, we are also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And so that's the manifestation of the love of God in us by, by our demonstration of our love one for another and our love for God by an honest definition, description, and manifestation of God in our life. 
We become a godly, loving person. Not only is it internal and manifested outwardly, uh, love is measured by sacrifice. Now, nobody likes this usually. This is a, this is a tough one because every, everyone that you choose to love, I say choose to love, you're not forced to love anybody. You, you make a conscious choice to love somebody. It will cost you something. You'll pay a price for that. There's no pixie dust, right? Hollywood can't make a movie where some guy can brainwash you to love perfectly or somebody wave a little wand and throw a little wing of bat and eye of newt in some potion and have you drink it and love potion number nine. It's a miracle. It's a decision and guess what? It's going to cost you something. What would love cost you? Time, inconvenience, patience, long-suffering, being a peacemaker. So, oh, it'll cost you. Money. Sure. Love costs. Love's always measured by sacrifice. You say, how do you know that? Well, as we have been studying the Word of God, are y'all looking at me right now? We did the keys to Bible study, right? One of the keys to Bible study is first mention, the law of first mention, right? So let's go to the first time love's mentioned in Scripture and see how God defines that in his word. And I think that uh, uh, you'll see something pretty powerful here. Um, first John, first, let's look at it. Uh, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation uh, for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And uh, so, you know, kind of kind of hitting that uh, Reformed theology there. You know, no, God loved the whole world, and Christ's Christ sacrifice was a sufficient uh, enough for everybody on the planet. Now, not everybody on the planet is going to accept that love, but it was sufficient for that. But nonetheless, God's love caused him to sacrifice Deuteronomy chapter number 7, uh, verses 7 and 8. The Lord did not send his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people, uh, because, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. Uh, so we see that uh, uh, God mentioned here in Deuteronomy that there was nothing that simply made a choice to love Israel, and they were the smallest of nations. They weren't great. They had no thing that was desirable in them, and yet God made a choice to love them. Let's go back to uh, Genesis 22, verse 2, and this is going to connect back with that sacrifice measure of love. Uh, and so the first time that uh, um, love is mentioned, it's connected with a sacrifice. Genesis 22, 2, and, and most of you are automatically going to the story of Abraham and his son Isaac. How many of you remember the story of that account? Now, Isaac was the promised seed by God. In other words, God said, Abraham, Sarah, you're going to have a child in your old age. Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90. Could you imagine that? And the answer to that question is no, I can't. In fact, I want to scratch my eyes out. It wouldn't be a natural thought process, would it? But what God did is God made a promise. And our God is so powerful that he turned, I believe, the hand of time back on Abraham and Sarah. Because after that, do you know there were kings that desired Sarah because she was beautiful? How many kings that could have any virgin in the land that they wanted to and had a, a harem or hundreds of concubines would choose a 90-year-old lady? Not many, if any, but they looked at Sarah as beautiful. God literally turned the clock back on Abraham and Sarah to allow his promise to be fulfilled of Isaac, the child of promise. Now listen to what God says. And he said, this is God speaking to Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, 
Now, I got to do a little Bible study here. Was Isaac Abraham's only son? No. no, but God refers to him as his only son. Why? Because Isaac was the son of promise. Who was the son of the flesh? Ishmael, right? Ishmael was uh, Abraham's son by a, a, a concubine. God didn't count that because that wasn't his promise, his word. That wasn't what he was going to produce. That was an act of the flesh. God was going to do something spiritual, so he produces Isaac. Thy only son Isaac, whom thou, what? Come on, say it like you made it. Love it. Come on, say it with passion. Say it like Barry, Barry White would do it. Love this, you know. Yeah. You like you some Barry White? Yeah, baby. All right, so that's that deep growl, right? He's that romance guy. But, right, love this. I mean, the one that your loins feel that passion for. You know, where you had no hope, you were in despair, you were dead. And I gave you life, that son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now, we know that Abraham loves Isaac, right? Uh, we know that this has blown him away, that he's been able to have a child at the age of 100, and man, he is loving this kid. And God says, now kill him and sacrifice him to me. Show me how much you love me. And you know what Abraham does? I Seriously, I don't know if I could have done it. Abraham, and, and you want to know why this was not a stress for Abraham? Because down in verse number 8, Abraham tells his servants, he said, I and the lad, we're going to go worship yonder and we'll come back and return. Knowing that he was going to kill his son. And you say, well, he really wasn't going to do it. Oh no, he made his son pack the wood up, carry it up the mountain, laid him on the altar, tied him, and raised the knife and was getting ready to plunge it to sacrifice his son in death to his living God. And God literally had to stay his hand. And God says, now I know that thou lovest me. Because you were willing to what? Listen, if your love for the one that you call Lord and Savior don't cost you nothing, What does your love for Jesus cost you? Well, I don't know, preacher, my life's great. Everything seems to be going my way. That's not how God measures love, does it? God measures love by sacrifice. Now I know. See, you girls... Look at me now. You, you tell your guys, just don't say it. Just don't tell me. What, what's next? Show me! Buy me flowers. Buy me flowers. Take me out to dinner. Get me a dress. Leave little love notes. It's not natural for us, gals. Little love notes. You want mints on your pillow? Go to the Hilton. See, love will cost you guys a night at the Hilton, right? It's cheaper than a divorce lawyer and alimony. <laughs> it's not natural for us to do those things, but love's always a sacrifice, even though that's not natural for us to do. Somehow we find ourselves doing it because it's the love of God manifesting itself. I mean, guys... How many times have you done something with your wife or girlfriend or fiance that's really not your cup of tea? And, and right, all your dude friends make fun of you. They call you a, a wuss. You're so whipped. <laughs> hey, baby, want to go hunting?
So you sacrifice and you do those things, you know, necessary. So this love, it's a love that is sacrificial and it will cost us something. And I, I, I think that's where I want us to end this morning because everything that we've just said, that's a pretty heavy weight. I, I don't know if you realize it or not, but I just laid a Buick on your chest. Has your love for Christ cost you anything? Have, have you sacrificed for him? I don't have time for church. I don't have time for prayer. I don't have time for my Bible reading. I don't have time to win souls. I don't have time to make friends and try to give them the gospel. I, I'm too busy with my own life. I don't have time to get involved in the ministry. I don't have time to be nice to my neighbor. I don't have time. I don't have time to do any of that, preacher. That's inconvenient for me to do that. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm just telling you how God measures it. God measures it by sacrifice. And has this thing been the fruit of the Spirit with the love of God manifesting itself in us? Or has it just been us playing church and trying to be right and do right? And that's been a frustration in your Christian walk as opposed to this thing being a joy because it's God working in us and through us. Romans 13, 14, and we'll quit here. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Give priority. Give priority in your life to the choice of God. Because he gave you priority. He gave you priority when he hung on the cross. He gave you priority when he was having his back whipped. He gave you priority when they nailed him to the cross. He gave you priority when he unrobed from his righteousness and stepped down from the throne of glory and veiled himself in human flesh. He gave you preference when people were spitting in his face and punching him, when they were mocking him. The very God that created and spoke them in existence was being railed on. He gave you thought and priority and preference. What about us this morning? Do we prefer him? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Is your life sacrificed for your Lord? Can you with honesty and integrity this morning say, this fruit is bubbling up in me and I've got no power over it. It's simply God smiling through me. Or has it been a struggle? Can I tell you this morning that it's a choice? And this morning, if your Christian walk has been laborious and a struggle for you, can I just ask you to choose Jesus? Sacrifice to him and for him and allow him to manifest himself through you. And allow that fruit to start producing in your life. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, can I just tell you, you don't have the love of God in you. You don't have the person of Christ in you. But that's not because God doesn't desire to be there. That's simply because you haven't made a choice to allow his love to be manifest in you and accept that love. See, it's a choice. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. It's a choice to love. 
I already know he loves you because he proved it on the cross of Calvary. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. The piano's going to begin to play. Can I, can I just offer the altar by way of invitation? Christian, if you've been struggling and you just need to make a refreshed decision and choice to love and sacrifice the Lord and allow him to work and manifest himself through you, you've been struggling in your walk, could I just tell you, come down here and have a time of consecrated prayer. Lay it all on the altar and say, Jesus, I choose you. Oh, manifest yourself through my life. I'm tired of the fight. I'm tired of the struggle. I'm tired of the disappointment. God, just manifest yourself through me. Would you come? Say, I, I, that makes me uncomfortable. That's right. Sacrifice. Sacrifice your comfort, your convenience. Do it for the Lord. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, could I just challenge you this morning? Receive the greatest love that you'll ever know and experience in history, in eternity, in any aspect, way, shape, or form. Jesus Christ's love is superior and he wants to manifest that in your life. He knows you this morning. He wants you, he wants you to know him. That's a choice. Would there be anybody here that say, Preacher, I want to trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to be saved this morning. I want to know him. I want to know that love you're talking about. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that this morning? Okay. How many would say, God spoke to my heart, challenged me this morning, and I've seen it in a new light. Praise his name. Would you slip your hand up and praise and recognition of God speaking to your heart this morning? Okay. put your hands down. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, it, it, it was hard this morning, but it's hard only because uh, it's difficult getting our flesh out of the way. Lord, I know that we do it wrong all the time, and yet your love never diminishes. You've never changed your love for me, and I, I want to thank you and praise you for that. Lord, help me to get myself out of the way so that you can manifest yourself in a greater way and people can see you and glorify you and know you because I'm loving according to your word, according to the fruit of your Holy Spirit that's in me. And I'll be quick to thank you and praise you and to give you all the glory and honor Lord, because you deserve it. If there's somebody here, Lord, that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, God, would you help them to embrace your love, what you've done for them through the cross of Calvary, dying for their sins, paying that price in full, loving them unconditionally, and then, Lord, having the power to live again, rise from the dead the third day so that we could have life eternal. God, would you help them to receive that love? Jesus, it's in your name that we ask and we pray these things. And all of God's people said, Amen. be in your place tonight. We'll be continuing our study in Genesis, and you won't want to miss that. What a challenge and an encouragement that's been to our heart. Thank you for being here this morning. God bless you. Uh, greet those about you. You're dismissed.